So I'm also going to talk briefly today on uh, exoplasmic manifestations of sarcoid. Basically, what I'm going to do is briefly uh, review the major uh, uh, clinical findings in sarcoid and review the major findings of sarcoid outside the chest, so outside the lungs, the lymph nodes in the lungs, and outside the heart. And also, when I do that, I'm going to try and review a bit of the clinical presentation, the relevance of very, various extrathoracic manifestations of sarcoid. So sarcoid, of course, is a multi-system disease of unknown etiology, and it's characterized on histology by those non-cuseating epithelioid granulomata. Typical onset is uh, in young adults, although, of course, sarcoid can affect uh, people throughout the age range. The ages, rather. You can have sarcoid in children and in the elderly. In North America, there is a very strong uh, increased incidence in blacks. And interestingly, that doesn't carry over to Europe. Uh, in Europe, it's actually the other way around. It, sarcoid more commonly affects whites than blacks. Um, sarcoid can affect almost every organ. And although sarcoid is relatively common, there's a very low mortality rate from 1% to 5%. And if sarcoid is fatal, it tends to be from pulmonary fibrosis or from cardiac involvement. Uh, so there's three base, basic clinical presentations. A lot of patients can actually be asymptomatic. In North America, asymptomatic patients account for about 10 to 20 percent of sarcoid. That number, though, interestingly, is much higher in countries like Japan where there's often pre-employment screening x-rays. It can be up to 50 percent of patients are asymptomatic. You can have an acute subacute presentation. It's up to 40 percent of patients, and they present with constitutional symptoms, fever, fatigue, malaise, anorexia and weight loss. You can also have a more insidious uh, onset, and that's the majority of patients in North America where you develop over months. They tend to present with respiratory symptoms rather than in the, in the acute presentation where it's constitutional symptoms. But 10% of these patients will have symptoms, initial presenting symptoms that aren't attributable to the lung. And these are the patients that are more likely to develop chronic sarcoid. So, some studies say that up to 40% of patients with sarcoid actually present because of their extrathoracic manifestations. Other studies will give a much lower number, but it's up to 40%. And in addition to having a higher incidence of sarcoid in North America, black socks also have a higher incidence of extrathoracic involvement. And as I said, you know, sarcoid can affect almost any organ system. Of course, the lung is the most common, and often we see lymphadenopathy as well. But they can affect the skin, and often it's erythema nodosum, those raised plaques, and lupus perineo in the face. I'm also going to talk today, or I'm going to talk today on the, a little bit about ocular sarcoid, marrow and spleen and liver involvement, renal, sar renal sarcoid, neurosarcoid, and musculoskeletal sarcoid. So neurosarcoid affects about uh, up to 50% of patients. You have a very mild, uh, non-specific uh, symptoms with headache and dizziness, but you can also have uh, affect uh, the cranial nerves, and typically that's the optic or facial nerve. Now, initially, facial nerve was thought to be more common, but apparently there are some studies uh, recently that show that optic nerve actually shows uh, uh, is more common. And uh, bilateral facial nerve palsy in a young adult should bring to mind uh, sarcoid. I don't know, Dr. Jingle, if you've ever <laughs> seen that presentation in the eMERGE, but apparently uh, sarcoid is what you should think of. You can also have a much more severe uh, presentation with actual hemiparesis, gait disturbance, and seizures, but of course this would be much less likely. So one of the uh, uh, presentations of neurosarcoid is actually aseptic meningitis, and you can get diffuse leptomeningeal enhancement with this that tends to go to the base of the brain. And this can be quite nodular, as in this example here, we can see in this T1 post-contrast image the nodular enhancement of the leptomeninges. Of course, uh, if you have this presentation, you'd include maybe sarcoid in your differential, but uh, you'd probably include a, a leptomeningeal carcinomatosis or tuberculosis and other infectious meningitis first. So we can also rarely get parenchymal lesions, which can be bright on T2 and flare-weighted imaging, and they can actually enhance when they're active. And in fact, the enhancement can even be rim-like, although we don't tend to include sarcoid in our magic doctor differential. It would be a very rare cause of a ring-enhancing lesion. So it also likes to go to the periventricular regions. This is uh, the only example I could find, though, however, of a uh, isodense lesion adjacent to the third ventricle with area of uh, surrounding T2 uh, hyperintensities corresponding to edema. On the post-contrast T1, you can see that it's enhancing. <coughs> 
You can also get involvement in the spinal cord. Of course, that can be the leptomeningeal just involvement just going down into uh, the, uh, the spinal region, but you can also actually have involvement of the cord itself. Here we have a uh, T2-weighted image, and you can see that the cord is expanded, and it's very hyper-intense, uh, and that's uh, corresponding to edema. Again, in the post-contrast T1-weighted images, you can see a small nodule of enhancement. Again, sarcoid would not be the first thing you would say here, but it is in the differential. Eye involvement is quite common, and it can be up at, into 25% of patients. Most common in the eye, though, is bilateral uveitis, which we're uh, not going to see much on imaging. But you can have uh, enhancing um, enlarged bilateral lacrimal glands in sarcoid, as you see in this case here. You can see the lacrimal glands, which are lateral, are uh, enhancing and enlarged. Ocular involvement in sarcoid can cause uh, blindness as well, rarely. And there is a syndrome, I have no idea how to pronounce it, here Fort Waldenstrom syndrome, um, which gives fever, parotid enlargement, anterior uveitis, and facial nerve palsy. And it's the lacrimal gland involvement that gives rise to that typical panda sign on gallium, and the lacrimal gland uh, hyperactive uh, here, and the parotid glands as well. So neurosarcoid carries with it an increased risk of mortality versus non-neurosarcoid. So where sarcoid had a, a, a mortality of 1% to 5%, if you have involvement of the central nervous system, mortality reaches 10%. And that's especially if you have involvement of the spinal cord or of the optic nerves. But interestingly, if the facial nerves are involved, you don't have that uh, same high risk of mortality. Liver and spleen involvement, I was surprised to find it is actually quite common. Um, up to 80% of patients at autopsy will have liver or spleen involvement. Most of these patients are going to have lung involvement, though. And the thing about this, I don't think we image it very often because it's usually asymptomatic. So unless the patient's being imaged for another reason, we would never, never see this. The most common finding is just minimal organomegaly, but they can have multiple small, discrete, hyperdense nodules, as you see in this case here. Here's a spleen, and you can see there's multiple. I hope that, yeah, well. You can see multiple little hypodense nodules here. And most of these patients will have abdominal adenopathy as well. The nodules can uh, be a bit confusing. They can get quite large and confluent and look very nonspecific. Um, I found an article that discussed really just liver involvement in sarcoid, and they showed that the nodules often tend to fill in post-contrast. Now, this won't be on arterial or even poral venous phase. It's a little bit more delayed than that. So all the images I saw where they filled in, it was uh, hepatic venous or later phases. On MR, they'll be hypo-intense on both T1 and T2, and at least early in enhancement, they will not enhance as much as the remainder of the liver. You can also see abnormalities on ultrasound. You can see a generalized heterogeneous liver with multiple hypospoic nodules. And in fact, you can even get fibrosis of the liver and an appearance very similar to um, cirrhosis. There is some suggestion of a coexistence with, prim co rather, with primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is, of course, extremely rare. And there's a few case reports of intrahepatic cholestasis and portal hypertension that they thought they had proved to be due to sarcoid. So this is an uh, uh, enhanced uh, T1 MR, and you can see this is enhancement here, but the nodules are actually these areas of hypo-intensity. Uh, hypo this is a CT in another patient, and you can see the multiple hepatic hypo-intense lesions. And as you can imagine, the, uh, the nodules, if you saw that appearance, you probably wouldn't immediately think of sarcoid, or you shouldn't. Um, the nodules can look very similar to lymphoma, metastatic disease, or opportunistic infection. <coughs> and trying to distinguish these two from patients with known sarcoid who may also have lymphoma or metastatic disease or infection, we found that sarcoid is less likely to give the large, confluent retroperitoneal nodes that are sometimes, or sorry, that should be or retroperitoneal nodes that can be found in lymphoma. But unfortunately, sarcoid can actually do all of those things. The article that I read on that said you should consider sarcoid, especially when the spleen is also involved. But I think, you know, you still have to consider lymphoma as well. So in that sort of situation, you have to correlate with blood work, markers for malignancy, but also markers for sarcoid. So you'd want to see whether the angiotensin converting enzyme is elevated and whether the patient is hypercalcemic. Ultimately, unfortunately, the patients may require biopsy. Another just important thing to remember is the treatment for sarcoid is steroids, you really want to make sure that the patient, uh, that it's not a hepatic infection because you wouldn't want to treat that uh, usually with, with steroids. <coughs>
a small percentage of people can actually have genital urinary tract involvement with their sarcoid, and this tends to be interstitial nephritis, glomerulonephritis, or nephrocalcinosis. And the nephrocalcinosis is due to actually the, uh, I think it's the, um, the, uh, the upregulation basically of vitamin D in sarcoid is going to lead to increased gut reabsorption of calcium. So you can actually get medullary nephrocalcinosis. Rarely, as in the liver and the spleen, people with sarcoid can get actually renal nodules as well. And the interesting thing, again, we, we don't tend to image this. These are usually incidental findings because renal function is, is almost always preserved. This is the only example I could find of the renal nodules. There's, of course, a big uh, simple cyst here. But if you look, the kidney is enhancing, and then there's these areas that aren't enhancing as much, at least. And uh, these are the, the sarcoid nodules bilaterally. So finally, I'll talk about musculoskeletal sarcoid. This can affect the joints, the muscles, or the bones. Up to one-third of patients will actually have an arthritis with sarcoid. It's quite common. And it's generally an inflammatory arthritis. It can affect the knees, ankles, elbows, and wrists most commonly. But usually, uh, we don't actually see any findings of, uh, of sarcoid involving the joints. If you do an MR on a joint that's affected with sarcoid, you can sometimes see some nonspecific signs of inflammation, enhancing synovium, a synovitis, or a tenosynovitis, or a bursitis. There is a Loughran syndrome, which is uh, patients with sarcoid who develop arthralgias, erythema nodosum, and bilateral hilar adenopathy. Muscle involvement uh, has uh, two forms two main forms anyway. One is a non-specific myopathy, and like other uh, myopathies, you basically just see uh, hyper-enhancing edema in the muscle. So you're going to see high T2 signal in the muscle. The second uh, form of involvement is sarcoid nodules. And of course, these are, these are pretty rare. These tend to occur at the musculotendinous junction, as in the example here. And basically, you have a central area of fibrosis, so that's going to be low signal on all sequences with periphery uh, periphery of enhancement and edema, so that's going to be bright on T2 and bright on post-contrast imaging. The typical uh, bony involvement, particularly in the phalanges of the hands and the feet, is to have multiple cysts within the bone giving you a lace-like honeycomb appearance. They can have erosions, but they tend not to have periostitis. Um, and you can actually have associated subcutaneous masses or tenosynovitis. In this example, you can see, hopefully, that there is a soft tissue mass here, or at least edema. And you can see these uh, intramedullary uh, cysts and that sort of lace-like honeycomb appearance. In another example, again, you can see that there's uh, a soft tissue swelling here. And you can see there's actually some erosion along the radial aspect. And again, you see that typical lace-like appearance. Um, and the MR can actually demonstrate uh, the changes in the soft tissues, which sometimes can be due to periosteal extension of the granuloma outside of the medullary cavity into the soft tissues. This is an example where they had initially thought this patient had gout. There's a tiny little cyst right here, and there's the soft tissue mass here. She went on to have an MR and a biopsy, and this was proven sarcoid. This is another patient you can demonstrate uh, in the medullary cavity here, there's abnormal signal, which extends out into the soft tissues. Again, extending out into the soft tissues. It's much more rare to have sarcoid involved the larger bones, um, but you can see it, and MR is going to be the most sensitive way of seeing this. I found every single description possible of involvement of sarcoid in the large bones. Some uh, said it was well-defined, some said it was ill-defined, some said they enhance, some said they don't. Some say plain film was uh, either sclerotic or lytic. So <laughs> I guess you can have sarcoid involvement in large bones, but I'm not sure if there's a clear, typical description of what it looks like. This is a patient uh, where there's a very subtle area of sclerosis in the calcaneus, and they went on to MR this patient, and you can see a very well-defined area of abnormal signal. This uh, is the patient's contralateral calcaneus, and you can see that the uh, separate lesion actually demonstrates some enhancement. So musculoskeletal sar sarcoid overall is quite rare. And if you do have involvement of the musculoskeletal system, you're typically going to have generalized sarcoid. Uh, muscle and bone involvement itself, as opposed to just the joint involvement, suggests that you have chronic sarcoid. And then you also have to remember that patients with sarcoid can get corticosteroid-related changes in the bones. You need to make sure that you're not 
uh, writing off AVN as a, uh, as a manifestation of simple sarcoid and not of the steroid-related changes. So just in conclusion then, sarcoid can affect almost every organ, and even if the primary presentation is extrathoracic, extra most patients at a minimum will have subclinical pulmonary involvement. If you do suspect sarcoid on uh, bone imaging or liver imaging, you need to image the chest for that subclinical pulmonary involvement, and you should correlate with angiotensin converting enzyme levels. It is important to remember, unfortunately, though, that ACE is nonspecific and can even be elevated in lymphoma. If you still unsure, you may need to go on to biopsy. Uh, ideally, that will be the most accessible lymph node or elevated skin lesion, but you may actually need to look at the chest. <coughs> and just as a final push for the PGY5s, include sarcoid and differentials, lower down the list, obviously, but particularly in, in young patients. Questions? Yes. I admit this, but it's a disease we talk about a lot, but what's the prevalence of the disease in Canada? It's, it's uh, depending on the ethnic, uh, the ethnic origin is anywhere from 1 to 67 per 100,000. I don't know what the overall is, though. So I, like Nova Scotia or Canada. Nova Scotia, particularly, no, I don't. But it's it's on the order of tens per hundred thousand. Well, one question: it's a we don't know the cause of it. But have you in your reading, have you found some new theories or new thoughts on the causation? Yeah, well, uh, it's not a new theory, but it's a suggestion that it's autoimmune, even though most of the time the autoimmune markers aren't up or it's post-infectious, uh, that we just haven't been able to figure out what the inciting infection was in your childhood. Or, uh, but I think those are both two pretty old suggestions. I don't know of any brand new ones. You mentioned the uh, gentle urinary involvement of 5%. Uh, the other area in there would be the scrotum. Scrotum, yeah. And, uh, that's often not mentioned, but... I've personally seen a case where oh, really? presented with, uh, with uh, bilateral testicular and epididymal masses. Um, yeah. And we did think of sarcoid and did the chest x-ray and sure enough it was quite right now. Wow. Yeah, I saw a few examples of that. I sort of pared it down, but uh, too bad I didn't get your pictures. That would have been neat to include. <laughs>